So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Long Island Backstory with Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs. Hi, I'm Gary Jacobs and welcome to another edition of Long Island Backstory. My next guest today is Dr. Patricia Pitta. And what we're going to talk about today, many of you see my shows that I do about divorce. Um, so what I decided to do is when I met Dr. Pitta and we started to speak about parenting and, and, and also about divorce, she really had a lot of insight into how to be a successful parent. And that's really so important. I said, you know what? We should do a whole show on how to be a successful parent because as you know, we don't read a book when we become a parent on how to become a good parent. And it's so important, you know, raising our children right. And, and this also has to do with many of, many of the things we're gonna to discuss today have to do also when you're divorced. You still wanna be a good parent, maybe more important when you're divorced. So um, I was really, really impressed when I spoke to uh, Dr. Pitt. I do speak to a lot of psych psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and a lot of them just don't get it. You know, you can learn a lot in school, but you have to be a certain person to actually get it and really, really understand what people are going through. So let me give you a little bit of background on Dr. Pitta, and then we're gonna get into the show. Dr. Pitt is a licensed clinical psychologist and board certified couple and family psychologist. She is the approved supervisor with the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. She's in private practice in Manhasset, Long Island, where she treats individuals, couples, and families throughout the life, the life cycle with specialization in child adolescent dilemmas, couples and marital conflict, sandwich generation issues and caretaking. She also specializes, specializes in anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. She's an adjunct professor and coordinator of postgraduate program in integrative couple and family therapy at St. John's University. She's the author of a book, Solving Modern Family Dilemmas and a Similative Family Therapy Model, where she describes how she conceptualizes treatment and offers cases throughout the life cycle. Dr. Pitta can be reached uh, on Facebook. She can be reached on Twitter at Dr. P-I-T-T-A. And uh, we're gonna scroll the number across the bottom of the screen. So there's many ways you can reach us. So Dr. Pitta, welcome. Thank to you. Long Island Backstory. That, that, that's a pretty impressive uh, background that you got there. So that's, no, why, thank that's, you. that's why you got your stuff. So first let's start off with, with something, Joan. What, what is a good enough parent? Because anybody's a parent, right? You have kids, you're a parent. Right. But what's a good parent? Well, a good enough parent is an imperfect parent and we create imperfect children and that is really the best we can hope for is children who feel good about themselves and parents that can communicate and talk with their children and love them and understand them but never look for perfection because perfection is not possible just being a human being. So I know when you work, you talk about uh, creating a, creating a, a healthy family. This is not something that just just happens. Right. So let's talk about the ingredients that you set forth in a lot of in your book and your research. You talk about the ingredients of a healthy family. First thing you talk about is having defined roles and how important that is. Tell me about that. Right, like in any organization, a family is an organization, and in some forms, it's a business. And in in a business, you need to have defined roles for the heads of the business and for the people that are working within the business. And it's the same thing that goes with the family. The family, each individual needs to know what are their roles. What, what, are, what is expected of the parents towards the children? What are the children expected towards their parents? What are their duties and responsibilities? Now, don't these things just work out though in a normal relationship? You, you develop roles just, or is this, are you, are you suggesting that you discuss you discuss the roles, like in a business, as you said, you, we know who the boss is, we know who makes the financial decisions, we know who makes the you know, promotional or advertising. Does this just happen or well, should it be discussed? Many things just happen, but eventually you're going to get into a quagmire somewhere. So it's really important to talk about these things so you're building a strong foundation that you're going to hopefully avoid a lot of the quagmires of life. Right. So what what about our rules? Tell rules. me tell me about rules. Well, it's really uh, important. Adult, we don't like rules, right? We always say I'm an adult now, I don't want rules. Well, <laughs> you know what? That's unfortunate, but we are always going to have the, rules. The rules in life. The rules of life. <laughs> and it's really important in terms of parenting for the parents to 
talk to the children and tell them what are the rules. So for example, let's take a young child. A young child, you're gonna say, you know, your bedtime is eight o'clock. And then you explain to the child, at 6.30, we're gonna take bath. At seven o'clock, we're gonna read a book. And for a half hour, you're gonna sit maybe in your room and it's very important, one of the important pieces in um, developing as an individual is to learn to self-soothe. And that's why it's important for children to be able to sit by themselves and whether it's reading a book or playing or just fantasizing, maybe for a half hour you're just going to sit in bed and just think about the day or whatever you'd like to do. So if you state that out to a child, they'll know what's expected and if they don't like it, they'll let you know and then it gives you opportunity to really talk with them about why you need to do certain things that you do. Which leads, which leads me to the next thing, which is compromise. So the example you said, you said your bedtime is say eight o'clock at night and the child says, oh, can I stay up a little bit later tonight? How important is compromise or is it better to have these firm rules? Well, I believe both things are important. Firm rules are important and the ability to compromise is important. And you know, I'm gonna jump to like a teenager because it seems like that's really where the, a lot of compromise needs to take right, place. Right. My friends do this, I want to stay right, out later, there's a party. As soon as the peer group becomes a very important uh, element in terms of how the teenager conducts and thinks about life. So the typical example is, you know what, all the kids are staying out till 12 o'clock and you want me home at 11, right? right? You're mean. You're mean. Overprotective. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, you'd have to really sit down and talk with the teen. Well, what is going on between 11 and 12 that would be so important for you to be there? And if you feel that your child is responsible, your teen is responsible, there might be room for some compromise. And that's really up to the parent to make that final decision. Remember, the parent is the head of the family. But there might be times when you're going to compromise, of course, because you want to also enable your teen to feel a sense of power over themselves too, and not totally controlled. So there might be the times when it's appropriate to extend the limits. But as I tell uh, parents, make sure if you have a teen, under age teen, that you know where they are, where, if there are parents supervising, Right, and, and I think, isn't that part of the learning process also learning how to negotiate and compromise that they're learning with their parents first because in life there's a lot of compromise and uh, that we have to deal with in life, you know, in business and everything, you know, relationships, so they're sort of learning at the same time. That's a very good point. Isn't it better that a child learns in the family how to deal with the struggles and the challenges of life than on the street? Right, so yes, yeah, so it's good to, um, bring these issues into the family and open them up. And that's all about really communication, right? And what, what about boundaries? How important is it to have uh, boundaries and what are some examples of boundaries that are absolute that you, that you wouldn't cross? Well, I don't know if I would ever say there are boundaries that I would never cross. Okay. Because I really don't believe in never and always in life okay. because anytime I've thought that way, it's always <laughs> <laughs> come to know. hit me, yeah. right? But there are certain boundaries that are very important. And what boundaries do for the child and for the adults, it really teaches them who they are and how far they can extend themselves. So just for example, say even an adult who maybe works too much, you push your boundary too far and then what happens? Sometimes you'll yes, fail, you'll be too exhausted, and it's the same thing down. with it's the same thing with children. You need to say there are certain boundaries in our family, like for example, if you don't believe that the children should be taking drugs, and that's an important piece, then you emphasize that. And that gets emphasized pretty young. Mm -hmm. And it's through your example. The best way for parents to teach anything is through their example. So whether it would be drugs, whether it would be religious education. Some families have a religious background, some don't. If you're going to teach it, where does it begin? It begins in the home. Right. So uh, one of the things uh, that you hear often, I think, these days is, what is your res where, where is the responsibility for creating a healthy family? I think a lot of times we say, you know, the school, we, we, we give too much of that responsibility to the school, you know, they have sex education in the school, and they're, they're basically, and a lot of parents or both parents are working right now. Where is the response, but at the end of the day, 
that you graduate and that school is done and, exactly. and you have the, the whole life. So where is the responsibility lie for creating a healthy family system? Well, in my mind, I can't talk for other people, but in my mind it starts in the home. And it starts as soon as the child is born how you treat that child, how the couple, what environment does that couple create in the home to make that child feel safe, secure, and comfortable with themselves. And you know, in the world that we live in, is a, there's a great deal of anxiety. Right. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the most important things we need to do as parents is we need to help our children learn to soothe themselves through healthy means. Yeah, I think that's important having a home that that they feel safe especially now I mean we have all these things going on in the world and Absolutely. you know there's drugs out there there's violence there's gangs there's terrorism and uh, you know having a home that they know that they can go to be safe you know I, I think is 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 very uh, important aspect and you know in terms of rules rules create safety for children really right children want rules they want yeah, they, you know they say that I think growing up people used to say kids want rules they want to know what the boundaries are they're more comfortable with that you know sub subconsciously you, you believe because now I think it's we've really sort of gone a lot of people the other way and especially in divorce situations where everybody says well I'm gonna be the kids friends and no more rules because I want my kid to be to like me right I think it's really a big trend it's really changed parenting style over years where there was strict rules and boundaries and now they seem to be a little bit more blurred maybe it's because of social media and I don't know well I think you're correct what I see a lot of parents doing is they're asking the children what would you like to do they're asking the children mm. to make adult decisions big, big and, burden. When, <laughs> and when I have like families in my office I will intercede and say no you state what the rules are and then if there's room for compromise or getting the child's desires or not there's room for it but really the parents are the head of the household and they need to take that whether they're in a uh, divorce situation or a you know or in a couple situation that's the tough part about being a parent yes. I mean it's easy to ask your child what they want to do and let them do whatever they want that's that's easy remember <laughs> there's plenty of time to become a friend to your child once they're grown up. You need to be their parent first. And I say we're only a parent, really, for the first maybe 17 years. Right. And then after that, if we're successful parents, we become our, our child's friend. Right, right. So let's talk about laughter. That's something in my, growing up in my house, so that was something that was always uh, important. You know, even, you know, in, in, I guess in my house, we did a lot of self-deprecating humor. You know, we would always make fun of our idiosyncrasies that, that we have, that every family has, and joke about it. But, you know, I do see some other families who are way more serious than, than others. And, and you mentioned uh, in your book about, about how important laughter is. T tell us about that. Well, it's really important to have a sense of humor. When I, when I think of laughter, I think a sense of humor because life has a lot of serious pieces and a lot of tough pieces. So we have to be able to kind of balance it out with a sense of humor. And some people say that life is 90% unimportant and 10% really important. So mm. can we laugh <laughs> at some of the, of the things that happen? Mm. And I think that's really important to be able to realize that, you know, we can't really control so much in life. Right. So yeah. a sense of humor helps you through. And, and, I know, and I know I've seen interviews with older people and, and people who are older and happy, and they ask them, you know, what are the keys? And a lot of them will say, Laughing. That's right. You have it's, to it's laugh. It's unbelievable. At, they say. If you can laugh at yourself, right. you can see your own foibles and how you make mistakes. And then you can change them right. and you can correct. But if you stay stuck in a very serious mode, you're not able to look outside yourself. Yeah. The Yuma kind of gives you that little window. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a program that you created called Creative Loving Discipline. Right. Tell me about that program. Well, this is where, as I just mentioned, the parents set boundaries, rules, uh, limits, fun, humor, and they also help their children to dream. What is it that they would really like to do, like to become? 
Is this, where is it? Is this a program you teach uh, to I, groups? Yes, I do. I teach to groups, and I also teach to my uh, families that come to see me. Right, right. So this is something, and for people who are watching, I mean, in an organization who wants to put together a program, I mean, I think, because, like I said, we, and I, I do it on my show, we talk so much about divorce, we talk about problem children after it's done. Right. You know, this is preventing it from happening, and a lot of times, even with younger parents, they don't know, and listen, we only know what we know, right? Right. I only know really what my family, you know, if I don't take a class on it or read a book on it or right. see it on TV, I only know what I know in my family. So And your family an is your model. That's I mean, right. this is it. So what is And I came out great, so I'm thinking it worked. <laughs> so, some may argue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what are some of the aspects of this creative parenting? One, as I mentioned already, is teaching your child how to self-soothe, how to modulate anxiety. Another is to listen respectfully. This is very important in a family. And what do I mean by listening respectfully? Is that when your child talks to you, you listen to them, you look them in the eyes, you repeat what they say, That's important. and then you respond. Because you're repeating what they're saying they know they're being heard. I think I think that's something you know worth elaborating on because I think right now, especially we're all so busy, we're all guilty of it. We all sit there and we're having conversation, but we're looking at our cell phone. I know I'm guilty of it too. Although when I raised my kids, cell phones weren't as, right. uh, as I had a little BlackBerry with nothing on it. But now with social media on our phone, I think a lot of us, you know, and if your kid's talking to you, you think it's okay to say every once in a while, uh huh, okay, uh huh. So what you said, it, it, I you know definitely something we could all learn from. It's something sort of simple, but I think it would become a habit. Right. If, you know, and this is at any child's age. Maybe it's more important as a young as Well, a young the child. most important thing in any relationship is for the people that are interacting is to be present. And part of being present It's not is just giving, physically present. Yes, is giving your attention. Right. Letting them feel you. Letting them know what you think. Listening to what they think. And then communicating and then compromising and talking. Another important piece is you never want to compare your child or teen to another child. You want to enable them to value who they are and what they do well. And if you want them to improve on something, then you be their teacher, their model, and say, you know what, you didn't do so well on your math test, and I know you really want to do better. How about you and I sit down and work on this rather than a parent saying, oh, you know, Johnny is so much smarter than you. He got a 90 and you only got a 70. Mm. You, you build on whatever strengths they have and you work with their weaknesses to build them up. So really it's a kind of a positive way of parenting not a negative or a comparative way. So, but, but right now, isn't there a lot more of this with the, with the standardized testing, that everybody, aren't kids being compared in schools much more, and then maybe that trickles into the home too, because they are compared to each other. I mean, so, it's such an emphasis on testing and so much pressure. You know what, it's really sad because I see children coming into my office, and when they start the testing, I think it's usually in the springtime, they come in so nervous because one, the teachers, that are teaching them are nervous because they're being they're judged, being judged right. by those test results and the children are feeling it and the parents are feeling it. And so what you really need to do is you need to be able to speak to the child about, you know, really, they just need to do their best. That's yes. all we can ever expect. So that's what, if somebody comes home and they say, oh, I, you know, I didn't do as well on this, you know, uh, standard test, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, you know, they're getting called to the principal. They need special education and tutoring, you know, and they're feeling anxiety about that. How do you, they are being compared because they're not doing as good as the average. Okay. Well, you're, you're presenting a very extreme case where it's probably a long-term set of, you know, uh, not doing well. and It's just not one test that would do that. But if there's a long-term uh, set that where they didn't do well, then you have to sit down with the school and get support and make a plan on how you're going to help your child. And then you're going to share that with your child and work with them. It's not a punishment. But you know, when you said about doing well on a test, it reminds me when I was a child, I remember one day I came home and I said, I didn't do well on that test, mom. She says to me, don't worry about it. 
nobody will remember it. You'll forget about it. <laughs> right. And that was really helpful. So, yeah. Right. You know, so she didn't make a big deal about it at make, home. No. So she, it's okay if there's a different world. You're saying if in school they, they, they're making a huge deal about it, but at home, I guess, back to that safe environment, you say, listen, you did the it, best. You put Well, putting in perspective is, yeah. it, is something I, I always say it's big. Like we all know at the end of the day, when you're 30 years old, nobody says, how did you do on that algebra test in, in exactly. seventh or eighth grade? It really doesn't. You know, for, for that matter, it doesn't matter what grade you got right. in school. Many successful people didn't do have great grades in, uh, in school. And I remember, I maybe was nine years old when my mother said that to me, and we both looked at each other and we just laughed. Yeah. And there's, there's the humor. Like, yeah, this is like ridiculous. But you're really talking about something much more extreme, say a child who's really struggling right. over and over again. Then you have to get the proper plan. You have to make the proper plan. Right. Also, another piece of the program is um, not punishing. I don't believe in punishment. What I tell parents is that children really deserve four things that they get without even just being born into your home. They get a place to live, they get love, they get shelter, and they get non-designer clothing. <laughs> and everything beyond that, they earn. Right. So when you present that to you, so many parents will come in to me and say, you know, my children are so demanding, they want so much, they're comparing themselves to the kids down the block, and especially when they get to be teenagers that have the very expensive designer clothing, plus the fancy cars. I say it's really simple. When you parent, you set what is expected in terms of what behaviors you need to see in terms of earning privileges. So, and I use the example, I say to the kids, if your parents went to work and they just sat at their desk and did nothing, what do you think would happen to them? And they would say to me, well, maybe the boss would come in and yell at them. I'd say yes, and maybe they'd lose their job. Exactly. And maybe they wouldn't have money then to feed the family. It's the same thing with a child. If you want to earn your time on Nintendo or PSP or on the internet or playing with your friends, you have to earn it. These are privileges. And if you want maybe a piece of designer clothing, that's something very special. You earn it. And what I do is I teach uh, parents, they actually make up charts with their children. And the older the children, the more the children partake in those charts in terms of making them up. And then they, they mark off the charts as they accomplish whatever it is. And they could trade their accomplishments in for privileges. And it really works. It's work for the parents. That's the problem, is that it's a lot of work for the right. parents to get off the ground. Right. So uh, I just want to go back a little bit to uh uh, complimenting. One of the things you say is don't over compliment. This is something I'm probably guilty of with kids is, is over complimenting. Tell, tell, me, tell me a little bit well, about that. Well, what I need is, you know, we do have this um, trend, and we've had it for many years, even when my children were young, is that every kid gets a trophy just for showing up. And in my mind, a trophy really is about something very excellent or maybe out of the ordinary. So, and then after a while, the children have like a blase, in their room they have 20 trophies, <laughs> and you say to them, what are they for? And they go, I don't know. <laughs> so I really think that at times we might overdo it. If you are going to compliment your child, I want you to be specific in the way you compliment. You know, Johnny, I really like the way you just spoke to me. That was very polite and that was very loving. I really like the way you studied for that math test. And look, you even got an A on it. Isn't that wonderful? Not, you're wonderful, you're great. The child will say, I'm not wonderful, I'm not great, because I'm doing all these things wrong. Or the other side of it could be they will develop an inflated sense of ego that really doesn't meet reality. So whatever types of compliments you give, make them specific and make them meaningful. And remember, be present and look at them in the eyes when you say it. Right. So uh, what about parents taking responsibility for their own actions? Uh, so this is a little bit different than everything you're saying is how to interact with your kid, your, with, your, with your children. But, and you, but you did talk about that we should set an example, but talk about taking responsibility as a parent for your actions. Well, the bottom line is we are the first line defense for our children. We are their teachers. And our children, I'm gonna use a psychological term, they introject, they take us in.
And there's a saying, for the first 13 years they take in, for the rest of their life they put out. Mm -hmm. So they are learning from us. So if we want responsible children, we have to act responsibly. So that means we have to not, let's take a car for example. If we don't want our teenagers to speed, we better not speed. We're setting the example. Smoking? Well, if you don't want your child to smoke, don't you smoke. Because what will they say? You do it. Right. <laughs> so why can't I do it? Yeah. So set that example. If you don't want your children to drink, you know, recklessly, same thing here. So really the parent is the first line of teaching in life. You talk about parents being present, you know, and I think, I think what you meant by this, from what I read, was more about really being there, not just physically being there, like just sitting back on the couch, both parents, you know, on their uh, on Facebook and watching right. TV, is, is not really being present. So explain. Well, explain okay, what you I mean. can tell you what I mean. Well, with young children, it's really important. I say to parents, just go take a walk, a simple walk, and talk about nature. Talk about the stars, the moon, the grass growing on the, just talk. And with uh, teenagers, it's really important to talk about what they're experiencing in life. And lots of teens don't want to tell you anything, right? Of course, right. So you How know was what? your day? Good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know the best thing to do? Teens love, and children, they love to hear stories about your life. Right. So tell them stories about your life, but remember, responsible stories. Not how you smoked pot and you got almost busted. Right, well, I think it's important because some people think, <laughs> well, I want to be honest with my, with my children, and they tell them these crazy stories of things they did no. as a child. You know? You're giving them license. So you have to set the mature example. And if you're watching a movie with, your children, with young children or teens, take a moment after the movie is over and talk about what went on in the movie. What did they like? What didn't they like? What did they see as responsible in that movie? What was non-responsible? Use every opportunity that you're with your child as a, a learning, learning opportunity. Right. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to go really quick through these things. Parents need to set the rules. I think we sort of already established right. that. What is resilience? Ah, resilience is the ability to bounce forward. Remember, life is full of disappointments and full of beauty. But when those disappointments come, we need to help our children to bounce forward, to look at what's left, not what's lost. Healthy risks. Ah, taking healthy risks. That means that even though the last time I tried to do this, it didn't work, I'm gonna be able to do it now because now I know how to jump on the monkey bars because my parents taught me. What is an I can, an I can attitude? Well, just what I'm saying, you have that, you develop that resilient attitude that, you know what, I can do it. Even if I failed once or twice, I, I did my homework now and I know I can do it and I accomplish it. And that's also helped by the school system, helping your child, the parents helping your child, and very important, the child learning to help themselves. Right. Well, I have a lot more to go through, but I'm gonna, we'll leave it with the book. Okay. I, I, I think you, you can definitely get the idea that Dr. Pitt knows what she's talking about. She doesn't skip a beat, and we're trying to go fast through a lot of very, very important things, and she's helped so many families. But this, this is a great book, and, and really, I got a lot of my notes from this book, which is Solving Modern Family Dilemmas. Where can they get the book? On Amazon. Okay. Right. Like everything else, you can get it on Amazon. And where can people reach you if they wanted to do uh, get therapy with you for their children or marriage well, or can, have you speak? They can go on www.drpatriciapitta.com or uh, at Twitter. Very good. And, and again, listen, if you have a, a church group, uh, a synagogue group, uh, any community group, I, I think this is a great thing because we really don't talk enough, especially now, we really don't talk about the healthy family enough right. in today's society. It's sort of gotten, uh, you know, forgotten about. So Dr. Pitta, thank you very much for thank coming on the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we're definitely going to have you back at a future date. We have so much more to talk about. I'm Gary Jacobs, and thank you for joining us on Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory is made possible in part by 
Americans for Legal Reform, the oldest, most successful legal group in the world. P.O. Box 2679, Huntington Station, New York 11746. Telephone 631-421-6390. Website, Americans, the number four, legalreform.com.